Good morning, dear family and friends. Uh, welcome to the service of worship this morning. It's just great to be together in this way. Uh, I would like to welcome Ryan doing the recording for us, Chris at the organ and piano, Keith that will sing for us, and Bill that will bring our prayers to God this morning. Um, as I've said, may God bless us, and uh, I think it's also important for me uh, this Sunday to note that if there's any one of you that haven't subscribed to the channel yet, Brian, I think that's in order, eh? That people should then just uh, subscribe, and also if you want to push that like button, more than welcome to do that. It helps with the online presence on YouTube. So and that's the reason why Brian is requesting this to happen. Let's call on God in worship. With the psalmist we say, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things that you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Amen. Dear family and friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn 205. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, in this wonderful morning, we worship you as Almighty God, who set the cosmos in motion and called all creatures into being. All that exists speak of your wonderful majesty. You know us by name and make yourself known to those who seek you. 
We are gathered to enjoy your presence with us and to listen for your word for our time and for our lives. We confess that many things compete for our attention and we are so often tempted to seek things that cannot truly satisfy. Forgive us, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In Psalm 145, the psalmist wrote, The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears they cry and save them. The suggested lectionary gospel reading this morning comes from John chapter 2, verse 13 to 22. It was time for the annual Passover celebration, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw money changers behind their counters. Jesus made a whip from some of the ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and oxen, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Do not turn my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house burns within me. What right do you have to do these things? The Jewish leaders demanded. If you have this authority from God, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you can do it in three days? By the temple, Jesus meant his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both Jesus and the scriptures. If Jesus did in our modern day world what he did in our scripture reading then, he would have had to answer the exact same question that was posed to him in verse 18 of our reading this morning. What right do you have to do this? And maybe Jesus wouldn't have been able to explain himself or even to make himself heard because of the protesters shouting at him, insulting him, um, and just requesting, what is this that happened here? You can just imagine if they had Facebook those days the Facebook postings of the cleansing of the temple, and all the social media discussions going on, those in favor of what Jesus did, and those not in favor of what he did. Our society sometimes um, display a kind of relativism that wants us to believe that making any judgment in any set of circumstances is not good. Because relativism in our modern day world feels that there is no real right or wrong. There is no real true virtue left in our world. Some believe that the closest that we can come to virtue is tolerance. Because if we have tolerance, we actually work towards cohesion between people. And we also safeguard ourselves that we don't hurt others. Intolerance in our modern day world just shows how unsophisticated you are 
and how dangerous you are. And this is how many people in Jesus' day, and especially those in the temple, felt about Jesus. I believe the Facebook page and the social media of his day uh, pointed to the fact that this is a very dangerous man because he stood up for what he knew was right and wrong. And Jesus' actions in cleansing the temple is many a time misunderstood by people believing that what we have in this story this morning is Jesus losing his temper, Jesus being out of control, losing control. And of course, when people lose their temper and get angry, and when they lose control, they are dangerous, extremely dangerous. But this is not what happens in our reading this morning. Jesus doesn't lose his temper. He doesn't lose control. What he does is an action that is deliberate with a specific meaning. And verse 17 of our reading this morning shares the reason behind Jesus' actions. Passion for God's house burns within me. A quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. Jesus moved into action in the temple because something harmful was happening to others. A religious mess, dishonoring his father and worship was happening in the temple. And this religious mess prevented people in finding a relationship with God. Our gospel reading this morning blows a hole into the idea that Jesus is only gentle, meek, and mild. And especially, Jesus is not that gentle, meek, and mild when it comes to the church, when it comes to uh, the leaders and the people that God wants to act in a specific way to present him and represent him in a correct way towards others and in this world. Jesus' actions in our reading was directed at hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his time and the hypocrisy of God's people in that time. They said that they believe in God, but their actions pointed in a different direction. And this is why it's impossible for Jesus to tolerate what he is seeing happening in the temple. The place where people were supposed to meet God and to become uh, his children and his people and to live as his children became a place of big business. And big business replaced true religion. Religion as practiced in Jesus' day in the temple was in a mess. And how can we describe a mess? Maybe the best way to describe a mess is to say that it's something that devaluates something of worth. Ritual sideshows became the order of the day. The selling of sheep and cattle and doves and the money changers all over the place. Uh, and all of these actions, all of these sideshows was just pushing through religion out the door. The temple was supposed to be a place of prayer, a place where people could come to God in prayer and, and make their desires and make the deepest felt needs of their lives known. And when we read Solomon's prayer, as recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8, when the first Jerusalem temple was dedicated, we hear that this is a place where people come so that God can listen to them, so that people can experience forgiveness, so that people can experience a new life. The Gentiles should also be able to come to this place and meet the living God. 
and experience renewal of their lives and then go back to everyday life practicing the will of God. But what Jesus found in this temple was a far cry from this prayer of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8. Instead of finding a place of worship and prayer where people go to meet God and encounter God for the first time maybe, Jesus finds a circus. Some commentators of the time sarcastically refer to the temple as the bazaar or the bazaars of the high priest Annas. The big business bazaar was set up in the place where those outside of Israel, the Gentiles, were actually allowed to enter. And that specific part of the temple was uh, known as the court of the Gentiles. And this is where the religious elite, the leaders, set up shop. A place where those who was seeking for God, and was supposed to experience the blessing of God's people introducing them to the living God, uh, was, was turned into this place of business. Spiritual leaders lost sight of God's calling and purpose for his people, and therefore led God's people astray. Instead of reaching those that didn't know God, with the message of the loving God, they are ripping these people off, even as they try and come to God. And dear family and friends, we cannot blame the Son of God for going into action in this set of circumstances. We cannot blame the Son of God for not looking for cohesion at this present moment. Because what is happening in the temple is wrong. And he needs to step in. And Jesus knew full well the criticism and the questions that would flow from his actions. It's almost like, who the heck do you think you are? to do this. Who do you think you are to do this? What is it that John wants us to understand this morning? I believe a very important aspect of uh, John's message, especially in chapter 2 through to chapter 4, is the theme of Jesus bringing about the newness of the gospel, the newness of God's kingdom, the wonderful theme of Jesus replacing the old with the new. And when that happens, there is no room for sideshows because the message is so clear. The old needs to get out of the way and the new needs to be introduced. John chapter 2 starts with the very well-known story of that wedding in Cana and Galilee. And then the wine at this wedding uh, is, 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 is up. There's, there's no wine left. It's done. And then Jesus asks his disciples to bring six uh, uh, containers uh, of stone that was used for the purification of uh, the Jews in those days. And, and fill them up with water. And these uh, six containers, stone water jars, were a symbol of the old. And then Jesus changed the water into the best wine ever. Out with the old, in with the new. The joy that Jesus Christ brings to people's lives. And in John chapter 3, we have that very profound and uh, truthful discussion Jesus had with Nicodemus. And Jesus shares with Nicodemus the whole reality of a new birth. And then in John chapter 4, we meet Jesus 
at the well with the Samaritan woman, a woman that's part of a despised people. Um, and then Jesus offers her living water, new water, a new way to worship, to worship God in spirit and in truth. And this is at the core of Jesus' ministry, uh, bringing in the new. And in our reading this morning, part of this uh, replacing the old with the new is found in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now we know Jesus is not talking about the physical temple, as the spiritual leaders in the temple understood it. Jesus was looking forward to... uh, his crucifixion, his death on a cross, breaking down, and then rebuilding the resurrection. This is why the name of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the life of Jesus brings us into the presence of the living God without any sideshows. And this third Sunday of Lent also invites all of us into the presence of Christ who brings the new and who removes the old. And as as we experience this, we as a church, we as spiritual leaders, should be very aware of the fact that we shouldn't allow any sideshow to come and to get in the way. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Creator, our Heavenly Father, our Savior, and our friend, once again we come to you in prayer before we leave this service of worship. Throughout the week we pray to you on our own as a child of God, bringing our individual hopes and dreams, our fears and needs, our worries and cares, our anxieties and griefs, and our joys. But at this moment, we have the opportunity to pray to you together as a family, brothers and sisters in Christ. We can never earn or deserve this time with you, but because of your love and forgiveness in Jesus, this honor is ours. And we are here with our heads bowed and our knees bent, and with all humility, that in all our weaknesses and doubts and frailties, you see something in us that we may not even be able to recognize or understand. And you are willing to gather us in your arms as your family. We know the vision, Lord, that you have for your world, You would share this joy, forgiveness, and peace that we have in you with all people. Your hope is for us all to live as one loving and caring family. But we know, too, that we are your instruments on earth to make this happen. As a family, you have given us different gifts. The ability to share your love in the spoken word. Some have the beauty of their voices. And still others have the talent to create and build, to teach and nurture, to protect and serve. And then there are those who have been given the knowledge and wisdom to nurse and to heal. Our prayer now, O Lord, is that you would open our hearts and our minds to look for any opportunity to be your servants and witnesses with whatever talents you have given us. Give us the right words to say, so that it is your words of comfort and hope that are spoken to all whose spirits are suffering. May we place your arms around the many who are ill or facing a future of anxiety and doubt, that they can feel your touch of tenderness, compassion, and strength. Father, help us to be still and perhaps just to sit in silence 
alongside those who need to hear your still small voice in their lives. May others hear and see through your voice of joy, your smile of gladness in the many celebrations of life that come our way. May all with whom we come in contact this week then see Christ in us. Lord and Savior, it is because of you that we can believe in a new tomorrow. And in the midst of all our present burdens and those that encompass all of your creation, may we go forward guided by your presence to a life that is beyond the shadows, filled with faith and confidence, and knowing that you are walking with us through this valley, and we are never alone. You journey beside us every step of the way, and when some moments seem overwhelming and we feel that we are lost, then you carry us forward in the strength of your love. Let us travel hand in hand in companionship with you and with each other towards that bright new day. And with the passing hours, we are one day and one Sunday closer to worshiping together as a family, not just in spirit as we are now, but in the joy of each other's presence. And now at this time, let us as a family pray together to our loving God, that all-encompassing prayer taught to us by our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. danced in the morning when the world was begun and i danced in the moon and the stars and the sun and i came down from heaven and i danced on the earth at bethlehem i had my birth dance then wherever you may be i am the lord of the dance said he and i'll lead you all wherever you may be and i'll lead you all in the dance said he I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John, they came with me and the dance went on. Dance then, wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and they left me there on a cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down and I leap up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I live in you if you live in me. 
I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all, wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.